Hey guys, welcome to today's Digital Consciousness TV where I get to interview some of the most amazing people around the world in a very candid approach over Skype and just engage with them in a great conversation. So today's interview is with a gentleman by the name of Sam Mack. Now you may have seen him on the project, some, this is for people in Australia, for the followers in Australia will know of him. Uh, he is uh, on the project on Channel 10, Weekend Sunrise, he also makes regular appearances on a number of different programs, The Living Room, uh, and he is also on the B League with himself and Jules, and, uh, and he's also was a radio or is still a radio personality many times he he appears on nova he was also in perth here on 92.9 um, so that's sort of where i connected with him years ago before he went to sydney and he I've, so we've been friend, friends on facebook for quite some time and i was following his posts and i sort of you know it, we're not following them but you know they popped up on the news feed and one of the ones that popped up on the news feed really got my attention now you might see i've only got one nail painted <laughs> and this is because of a campaign that he's an ambassador for called the Polish Man campaign and it's about uh, helping eradicate the violence for children around the world and it's about being a polished man and because 90% of the violence is, is uh, perpetrated by males uh, and this is a beautiful campaign of uh, people in Australia who are uh, believe in you know eradicating this violence because kids should not have to um, go through any of this and so he's an ambassador for this Polish man campaign and it's, a, it's an initiative of um, YGAP and so basically that popped up on his newsfeed and I saw it and I thought you know this is a this is a guy in media who is also very digitally conscious. So we got into a conversation and I talked a little bit about the Polish man campaign but then also about uh, the media and his perception on the media and uh, you know where uh, do, do the media take it seriously enough of what they're putting out into the TV streams do they really consider the ripple effect it's having on a subconscious level with people so I asked him a few of those questions really interesting and uh, let me know what you think have a look at the interview and until then please keep digitally conscious peace well, thank you so much, Sam Mack, for joining us on Digital Consciousness TV. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Tanil. It's um, nice to see you. It's been a few years since we've um, caught up uh, in person, so it's nice to uh, be in the digital space. Yes, I know. Isn't it great? Mm. Now, look, I wanted to chat to you about, um, I suppose, the thing that really attracted me to wanting to talk to you was, uh, which we'll cover off in shortly, is about the Polish Man campaign and um, some of the great work that you do in the community whilst also being in the media. And um, I, I suppose before we kick into that, for people who I'm sure that if they haven't seen you, they would have. I'm sure they would have seen you probably on the project or on uh, you know Weekend Sunrise or um, the B the B League. I think it's starting yes. up again, so you've got yeah. that going, and and a few other um, and and also through radio as well. But um, you know, if people who don't know you, what, what's been the journey of Sam Mack to this point, and some of those defining moments that have formed you to this moment right now as to who you are and what, what has shaped you into having the compassion that you have for the community today? Well, I guess in terms of my career, it's, it's really as simple as one word, and that's creativity. So from school age, I was always excited about making something from nothing or collaborating with other students or whether they be teammates at a soccer club, just creating something that's unique. So creativity is is first and foremost, what drives me and why I'm so lucky to be able to do what I do for a career, you know, whether that's a TV cross or radio shows or writing articles or writing sketches, like it's all about creativity. So that's kind of how I've landed in the career that I'm in. Um, in terms of the, the compassion side of it, uh, I think it's just a natural human trait that most people have and some people I think are just a bit more active about it than others. Um, I'm lucky in... in the access that I get to people and the, the access that I get to an audience through my work that I can help people and, and help the right organizations and give them a little bit of a boost in terms of, you know, getting it out to a social media following or hosting events, you know, or throwing some creative ideas at them, using my skill set to help worthy causes. So, mm. yeah, that, that's kind of how those two have, have come together. Mm. And what, what, what is it that, where do you think the crea creativity comes from and do you think that... Um, you know, especially as and as men growing up in the society that we have, do you think that 
the there there is a, a, a huge lack of this creativity. I think it's you know as men we tend and this drives into the Polish Man campaign, but you know as kids in society and and boys especially uh, are very much taught to you know it's they're they're taught to be a specific way you know and I think blokes get it tough in the sense of no vulnerability. No creativity. Don't harness your feminine energy whatsoever. You've got to be masculine, macho, and not feel anything. Um, <laughs> you know how? How do you do? You think that that's you know that's created a real problem in our society with boys and, and young adults of today? I think that that still exists an element of that. Uh, I do think, on a positive note, that that's changing mm. uh, for a number of reasons. I think, first of all. Um, the access that young kids have now in terms of technology, making their own YouTube videos, creating a podcast, not having to pay to make those things is yeah. fantastic because it means a kid living in his you know, parents' place somewhere in rural Australia could have a million followers on YouTube. There's no, it's more of a democracy now. I mean, it means there's a lot of rubbish out there as well. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> um, but, but I think it, it provides a platform and it's, it's easy and it's cheap which I love. I think that's so great. And the more people who are getting creative, the better. And for for young guys, I think it's improving, number one, because of that. It's easy and the access and the platform. Mm. But I think, number two, um, in my experiences, <laughs> women are attracted to that. Girls are attracted to that. So, you know, a guy who records a song on his acoustic guitar in his bedroom mm. is suddenly going to have these female fans and female followers. So, you can be that old school guy who's like, oh, I don't want to show any creativity, but you're going to be pretty boring and pretty lonely, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, so I think obviously guys, young guys in particular are driven by getting the attention of young girls <laughs> and, you know, meeting a girlfriend or whatever it might be. So that's another motivating factor. Um, yeah, I think it's changing. I think that social media has certainly helped that. Um, and it's now easier than ever for young guys and girls to express mm-hmm. themselves creatively. Mm-hmm. What would say? What would you say would be one of the most um, impacting creative projects you've ever worked on? Um, I've worked on so many that you know are really special to me for different reasons. Um, probably top of top of mind at the moment is the B League, um, which is a little comedy soccer segment that I do with a mate of mine, Jules Schiller. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you and I talked about that when I was just yeah. starting it up and I was doing my own little YouTube series as well at, at, at my place in Perth called Lights, Camera, and Action. That's right. Um, but, <laughs> but B-League um, is just a five-minute lighter-hearted look at football, you know, mm-hmm. some comedy involved in it. And I think I'm really proud of that one because um, I started it with Jules from scratch. Yeah. So we designed the logo, we picked the colors, we, mm. you know, created the, I guess, the brand, you know, created yeah. what, what we were for and what we were against, what we were happy to do, what we weren't happy to do. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's not the biggest show in the world by any stretch of the imagination, but we've got a great group of followers who get it, you know, yeah. people who engage with us. And, and it comes back to the creativity. One of the key pillars of what we do with the B League is promoting and crediting young people who send in memes or send in suggestions or send in jokes. Um, you know, one way we do that is in each episode we have an award. We have either, we used to call it the Golden Cornthwaite, named after a player that we know, Robbie Cornthwaite. Mm. Um, this season it's it's going to be, there's a name change for legal reasons, so it'll be called <laughs> the Sir Robert Cornthwaite Medal. Um, <laughs> and that is basically uh, as a way of rewarding young people who've sent in something that's made us laugh or something mm. that's added to one of our jokes or they've created a joke of their own. Uh, and we find that we get sent a lot of stuff. And, you know, I'd rather have 10,000 followers who get it and engage with you than 500,000 who barely check it and are just yeah. a number. Like, I'd much rather an engaged, smaller, active audience. And mm. that that is so much more rewarding. We get so much more out of that. That mm. feeling of, you know, someone, you know, in their bedroom <laughs> has gone to the trouble of spending one hour to make a stupid little photo that they send us. We love that, you know, yeah. like, that's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And and I suppose with, um, you know, uh, with I suppose the stuff that is a lot of the information that is fed through the media and that we see, it's so nice to get something that's lighthearted for once, you know, something that does bring joy and laughter into people's world. Do you find that that's one of the the gifts of what of the work you do with and, and why that has attract why you've been attracted to um, you know the the comedian lifestyle as well 
Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, with the B League, for example, sport coverage is mm. pretty 101. Like for the most part, particularly in Australia, it's it's you know pre-game where they talk about who's playing who, the game itself, and then post-game, oh, what did they do wrong? And they have a mm. quick chat with the player, and it's like, oh, you know, the boys gave 100, percent but we need to fix it next week. And it's just, <laughs> I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in watching the game and then seeing the personalities that the players have. And that's yeah. one of the great things that we've been able to do with B League is to go out to the clubs to meet the players, to show another side of them. And the fans love that. You know, as a, as a football fan, I love seeing players laughing and seeing what sort of personalities they have and seeing what they're like away from the pitch, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's one of the real bonuses of doing the B League. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And, I mean, I mean, for the society we have today, so I've seen a lot of kids and adults that would sit in front of TV in almost a comatose state and they're kind of going into this, you know, so where, they, where they watch it in a COVID state and then subconsciously they go on to replicate what they see on TV without yeah. really realising it. And obs- observing this shows me the impact of what it is we feed into our minds, you know. And I'm interested in your view being in the media most of your adult life. Do you feel that, you know, behind the scenes before a story comes out, so to speak, that, if, that it is considered with enough importance of the ripple effect that that's going to have? Um, or this particular story will have on a society and have you ever been in a situation where you've been challenged um, with your personal integrity and what did you do? Yeah I mean that's a really interesting question. Um, I think I think definitely agree that it does influence people. I think the other side of that is most of the decision makers in you know these media organizations be it a radio station or a TV show or station Mm -hmm. producers etc their job is to get as many people watching and talking about the show as possible. So Mm. that is the motivating factor for the majority. I mean, there's definitely shows like, you know, I'll give credit to The Project, who I've done a lot of work with. Mm. Um, I think in terms of my personal experience, are one of the best shows for actually having integrity and genuinely wanting to get important messages out there and and educate people Mm. um, and not always taking you know, the sexy option that's going to get, yep. you know, the, the, the great number of viewers straight away. There, yeah. There's a bit more, there's a bit more um, depth to what the project does, I think. And that's um, probably, which, I suppose, you know, part of their success, isn't it? I mean, it goes to show that they've gone outside of the box of not feeding all fear and all guilt and all shame and just stories of drama. Um, you know, you switch on the news and everything's dying. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And it's like it's nice with something like the project, like you say. You know, they've gone outside of that mold and they're and they're looking at good news stories. They're looking at also looking at the relevant stories, but they're not putting the spin on it as much as um, you know, in comparison, I suppose, to to other traditional um, news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Like the project definitely does some of that stuff and some of the kind of showbiz and yep. and you know. Because it's it's the combination of like lighthearted and then you know meaty and lighthearted and meaty. So yep. there's definitely elements of, of that on the show as well. But I think um, I think that viewers are smarter than a lot of the people who run shows give them credit for. And mm. you know certainly not not all, but in my mm. experiences, I've worked with you know some top level people in TV or radio who I feel at times underestimate the viewer and sort of pigeonhole the viewer a little bit and, and maybe mm. dumb things down a little bit too much. Um, so when a show like The Project, for example, goes into a bit more depth on an important issue that maybe requires a bit more uh, explaining for people to understand, I think people respect that. And I think, yeah. you know, people give more trust to a show like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's fantastic what mm. they're doing. Mm. So let's have a little talk about, um, you know, well, before we jump into Polish Man, which is the thing that really attracted to me to want to talk to you, um, you live in a really highly switched on world like I do as well, but, you know, TV more so than me, but, you know, you're, in, you're heavily in, in TV and radio and as well as in social media. So being so switched on, I mean, you know, we, we, what do you do to switch off? What's your switch off mechanism? <laughs> do you get um, to switch off? <laughs> Yeah, I, I probably um, it, it doesn't sound like a great answer because it's still using those devices. Like you know, I'll watch Netflix. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, Netflix and chill with my cats. I saw that last <laughs> that last post. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and but when I say watch Netflix, I'll watch something away from what I normally do. Like I'll watch something. So, for example, at the moment, I'm watching a lot of great 
documentaries on Netflix like yep. David Attenborough, yep. you know, like wildlife type stuff. Or yeah. there's a great series called The Human Planet, which is yep. um, which shows how people have managed to adapt to live in such different conditions, like be it living in the desert, living, mm. you know, in the ocean. People live out in the ocean some in some areas. It's pretty amazing. People, wow. you know, living in cities, obviously. So. Yeah, I, I watch things like that. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Mm. Podcasts are a great way to sort of ease yourself into fall asleep. I, yeah. I, I often wake up and I'm like, oh, I missed the last 20 minutes. I'll have to listen to that tomorrow night. Um, so I listen to a lot of podcasts um, and like I guess just a bit of exercise, you know, running and, and music. You know, I play guitar. Yeah. So guitar is a great way for me to, you know, tune out of work mode. I, I yeah. really get a lot of enjoyment out of just, you know, half an hour just learning some new songs and having a bit yeah. of a muck around on the guitar. So, yeah, they're probably the main areas for me. Yeah, what about, what do you do? Uh, meditate. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I meditate most days um, and I have digital detoxes. So right. I have certain days I'll take a whole day off or like last couple of weeks ago I had three days, no devices at all. Was and that hard the first time you did it? Yeah, and it's actually, you know, it's really interesting to see how we become so addicted, like mm. even like we've become a society of Pavlov's dogs where we hear that notification sound and it's like, bing, oh, oh, hang on, I've got to Absolutely. attend. Absolutely. Yeah, so and, it, and it I'm, almost I'm, becomes, I'm, yeah. it becomes a bit of a filler, doesn't it? Like, you know, for example, yeah. it'll be, say, someone's waiting for a bus and yeah. it's like, oh, it's still two minutes, great, I'll yeah. check my Facebook. And exactly. it becomes just this um, habit now where, you know, it's any downtime, be it 30 seconds, someone yeah. will go, even sitting at a traffic light, someone will go, oh, I better yeah. check, you know, yeah. it's like and, and filling the gaps. And what that's doing is keeping us so switched on, which is pumping up our adrenaline levels at, uh, and all of our cortisol levels, at cortisol levels, and we're constantly in a state of stress, you know, so mm. we're constantly on. And yeah. so, yeah, so I do things like the other day I was at a cafe um, and I decided not to look at my phone. I thought, right, I'm just going to sit here and look around. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of felt a bit awkward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, know? you would. Well, so it, I it test is, it out. It, it is the exception now. I saw a yeah. great. I don't know if you saw this photo just the other day. Um, I think it was like a some artist or some like a band or someone was mm. like doing a uh, public appearance, and there would have been about thirty people in the shot, and yeah. twenty nine of them were filming or were taking photos. Yeah. One of them was a really old lady. She would have been maybe seventy five years old who was just watching the moment. Like, and <laughs> and the sort of meme was like. Be in the moment, you yeah, know, right, like yeah. enjoy the moment. Like, yeah. And I, last week I was working with a project and um, I was in Melbourne chasing Justin Bieber, so my career is going really well. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw that. I saw you, you gave it a good red hot go. So. Yeah, and, and look, that stuff's fun. I enjoy little, little challenges like that. But again, it was interesting. He was, he was performing on a rooftop, so mm. only a couple of hundred people won tickets to watch him on the rooftop. But I was kind of following the fans to go, you know, like why is this so important? And yep. And these, these youngsters, they would have been mainly girls aged sort of like 14 to 18 mm. who were on the ground, couldn't even see the performance but could faintly hear it mm. and they could see maybe one-eighth of the top of Justin's head. <laughs> but to his credit, a couple of times he sort of popped his head over and gave them a wave and that, was, that meant the world to them. Yeah. And, but my point is that all of those girls were filming it, yeah, you know, and yeah. filming the whole thing. Yeah. And what are they going to do? Like put that up on YouTube and, and you know, then, like it's going to get 20 views. Relive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that it is. I mean, that's uh, I, in, in my book, Digital Consciousness, I'm actually writing about that very point, you mm. know, the fact that, um, you know, we, we've become yep. so reliant that we've forgotten now how to be in the now moment. We've actually yeah. forgotten how to become present into what we do and, and actually appreciating the very moment that we have, this very moment talking to you, being just in this moment, not thinking ahead, not thinking of behind, just being just now. Yeah. And I think that that's, as a society, in part of my, my opinion is that, you know, as adults we have to teach our next generation of switched on kids how to unplug. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if we did start seeing digital detox clinics around, <laughs> you know, mm, yeah. sort of, you know, it's getting, it's getting to that point. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's well, it's even, I think, um, the project, I saw a, a promo the other day doing a story about how the dating world is also in that space, how, yep. Yep. you know, less people, less younger people are having sort of longer relationships because they're spoiled for choice and it's mm. literally just swiping and swiping and oh, I'm bored with this person and it's all so easy and it's all on a platter. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you think it's doing to our culture, our society? What do you think it'll, it'll do to us if we keep going like that? Uh, I, like I'm not sort of doomsday about it because there's mm. also a lot of positives yeah, to it. Like there's also a lot of great 
things about it and create power with you know it's 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 like anything it can be used for good or for evil um, yeah, that's right. so I think I think it's going to like you said with you know the detox thing I have heard a little bit more about that kind of thing happening so mm. I think it's it's also new it's it's you know like 20 years ago it was nothing like this you know 10 years ago it wasn't even this developed what's yeah. it going to be like in another 10 years mm. it's it's all evolving and I think People are still getting used to it and it's a lot of trial and error. But I, I think you're right. I think there will be a little bit of a movement towards, you know, tuning out or whether mm. it's with young kids like, you know, two hours a day where you're not allowed to have any, not allowed to have your iPad or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that's, that sort of thing is, is going to start to happen. But mm. I'm also excited by it because, you know, look at what, what you can do. Like yeah, with, that's right. With it, phone, well, it connects with, us. It connects yeah. us. Yeah. The, the paradox is it connects us so much like uh, than we've ever been connected before, yet we can also be so disconnected at yeah. the same time. So it's yeah. kind of got that that paradox of it being, um, you know, and I, I've seen it firsthand how it's changed movements around the world. You know, we've been able Definitely. to connect with people. So there's so much positive with it, but it's how do we – how do we balance that in exactly? Because you know, yeah. like like you say, now these kids are at, at concerts and they're actually not even in the now moment. They're too busy filming it, and they and it's almost like we need to educate them about film it. But yes, film it. That's the world yeah. we're in. We're in digital, but <laughs> yeah. take a moment to just absorb it. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, look at us uh, <laughs> ranting yet having a conversation on Skype. I know, right? <laughs> the paradox of it all. <laughs> So, yeah, so I think it's like anything. I think it's like you say, it can be used for good or evil. It can be used for, um, you know, and I think that it's it's a beautiful, that's why I love the space so much. I do and why I am in the space is, you know, I love it so much because it connects us like we've never been connected before. But there is this education aspect we need underneath that to sort of teach kids how to switch off and how to unplug and that if every, you know, I think I saw a great quote that every even if you unplug everything, it'll still work when you plug it back in, including, <laughs> including yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's a really yeah. good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think there's going to be a lot more of that happening over the next five years or so. But at the same time, like yourself, I'm, I'm still mm. excited by it. I yeah. still think it's great. Yeah, yeah, it is. It brings us together. So, um, so let's talk about... Boom. Yeah, Polish, thank you. <laughs> polished man. Now, people, if you were seeing men walking around with a polished nail <laughs> on their uh, polished nail, maybe on the train, and you see, and you think, okay, what's this guy about? Is he? Uh, is he a bit, what's going on here? Is he into something weird? Like, yeah. what's, what's this one one polished nail thing going on? So, this yeah. is an amazing initiative that you've become an ambassador for, which I'm super proud of. I think it's great that you're standing up to do this because anyone that is in um, the public eye, like you are, I think it's really important to um, use that voice for, you know, yes, you use it for fun. We do all the things we've got to do, but you're also, what I've noticed in your journey is you do a lot for the community and, and that's a beautiful thing. And I, and I oh, thank you. You know, and so um, the Polish Man campaign was one that stood out to me. You know, globally, I think I saw some of the stats, one in five children are affected by violence before the age of 18. And yeah. um, you know that's just that's just crazy. Now, ninety percent of more more than uh, what was it? Ninety percent of sexual violence against children is perpetrated by men. So the Polish Man campaign. Tell us all about it and how you got involved yeah. and what it was that you loved about it. Well, thanks for giving me an opportunity to chat about it because mm -hmm. it is such a great initiative. So it's it's run by a group called YGAP. Mm -hmm. uh, they're based in Melbourne. They do a lot of fantastic charities. You can have a look at their website to see some of the amazing things that, that they've done. So the head of YGAP is a guy, young guy named Elliot Costello, who's the son of Peter Costello, the yes. politician. Yep. And Elliot Costello only set up Polish Man last year. So this is only the second year of Polish Man. So you can see I've got my now I've got a bit of a I'll get it close up because I've got a bit of a lightning oh, bolt you on do. there. <laughs> yeah. But I need I need to get a new one because that's that's about five or six days. Oh, I don't realise how often you guys have to do your nails. Oh my God. I know, right? It's hard I, being a chick. That's why that's why I don't do it. <laughs> I've only um, done it for this instant. Yeah. Um so so like you said, yeah, I, I had no idea about that statistic. Um mm. so they approached me. Uh, a little while before the campaign to see if I'd be interested in supporting mm. it. Um, and they told me that statistic, that one in five children under the age of 18 globally experience some form of violence before they turn 18, which is just so scary. Like one in five, that, that's mm. horrific. So mm. that really shocked me and, and made me think I definitely want to be a part of, you know, educating and raising money and awareness for this this particular issue. Um, and yeah, like when I, when I sort of started to dig and, and learn more about it and read the info that they gave me and, and check out a few websites that they linked me to, I've discovered that a lot of the time it's by people that they know um, 
you know, people that are known to the family, which is even more heartbreaking. Mm. Um, and so back to Elliot Costello, he, he was in Cambodia a couple of years ago and through one of their charity groups were meeting a lot of the young kids and, you know, just sort of helping out with some of the, the areas that maybe needed, like socioeconomic areas that needed some help. And he got chatting to a young girl, I think she was eight years old and her name was Thea and he just had a really good bond with this young girl, like having a laugh and having a chat and um, she painted one of his nails, just as like, you know, mucking around, having some fun and, mm. and what have you. So he just didn't really know much about Thea, but he just sort of had that experience and thought, oh, what a, what a great young kid. And then mm. it was only, I think, the next day when he was chatting to the organisers and they said, oh, do you know um, Thea's story? And he wasn't. And Thea's story was that she, her father had passed away and she was sent to an orphanage. Now, that sounds like, you know, it's going to be a safe zone, but she was sexually abused every day. And this is an eight-year-old girl, which is just absolutely disgusting. So, and this is particularly when it's a place where it's supposed to be a safe haven, you know. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, um, the the person behind that was found out and, and you know, I, my understanding is was jailed and and obviously that was that was taken care of in a sense. But... I guess the thing that stood out for Elliot and part of what inspired this campaign was how forgiving she was because she wouldn't meet a lot of Western males. Um, mm -hmm. So how open she was to chat and to have fun and to just kind of, you know, live life. So it was through that experience that Elliot decided to, well, he actually said to them on the day and he said to her, he said, look, I'm going to do something for you when I get back to Australia. So he took a bit of time and then he sort of realized that, oh, that, that nail thing was like, that was a cool experience and that was kind of where it, you know, what, what they enjoyed together and, and then he researched it. He researched more about her story, researched more about, um, you know, violence towards children and, and that's where they, they, I guess, discovered that statistic of the one in five um, mm. globally experience some form of violence, be that sexual, physical, you know, psychological before the age of 18. So... It's quite simple. He said, I want to encourage guys because you know, the majority of the perpetrators are men and a lot of the time men that are known to the families to paint one nail to represent that one in five children mm -hmm. and basically to, to um, emasculate men a little bit but also to get them owning it and to get them talking about it and to raise money and raise yeah. awareness. So it's, yeah, it's, it's so simple but so brilliant because... Yeah. You know, I've, I've had it started on the first of the month, so I've had it for, um, you know, a week and a bit. And a lot of people ask because it does look different on a, on a guy to go, oh, what's the nail about? And then suddenly you're in the conversation and, and you know, everyone wants to support it. People mm. want to know what's the website, how can I get involved? Um, so, yeah, it's, there's still about a week or so to go with it. Um, I've set a target for myself to raise $1,000. I've already raised over 500 So, yeah, every little bit obviously helps. Uh, and more importantly, it's getting men to take ownership of it and getting that message out there. So, mm. yeah, I'm really proud to be involved with it. I think it's such a fantastic initiative. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, and thank you for doing it and standing up and doing it. So what, what happens once the funds are raised? What, what does it all go towards, do you know? So it's a combination of a few things. Um, some of the funds will be towards making sure that it can happen again next year and making sure that it, you know, is bigger and better and, and is really out there and has a presence next year. And then uh, the majority of the funds, to my understanding, will go to um, to people who've been a victim of it, who've mm -hmm. experienced it, but also to um, organisations who are doing great work with prevention. So who are who are trying to get in there before this stuff can happen. We're trying to mm -hmm. see warning signs and you know at risk children like getting in there before they you know have to experience something so horrific like that. So. Mm -hmm. What a fantastic way to distribute the money. Um, I think over a couple of hundred thousand dollars was last year, aiming for even higher this year. So, That's yeah, awesome. and it's only the second year, so it's yeah. already starting to catch on. It's starting to get, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of guys involved and even yeah. a lot of ladies involved in, you know, painting one nail and encouraging their, their husbands or their boyfriends or what have you and, and getting them sponsored. And, um, you know, even if you raise a hundred dollars, it's mm. great. It's a yeah. hundred dollars a very important cause. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really exciting to um, to do it over the next week or so. That's awesome. Well, look, anything we can do to support, I'll, I'll put the links in below so people know how they can support you and uh, and get to that $1,000 mark, which would be great. Thank you. Great. Um, and you also do some great work as well for, for animals. Um, yeah, what, what kind of stuff are you doing at the moment um, currently with animals? 
Yeah, well, I started actually when I was in Perth um, with Shenton Park Dog Refuge, who are great. They're one of the best in the country. So um, I used to host a few events for them and do a bit of voluntary work with them. Um, we once did a thing on the project where we found Australia's ugliest dog a home. <laughs> now, it wasn't ugly at all. It just had a weird overbite. Its name was Tyler, beautiful little black black dog, and we ended up getting it a home, which was fantastic. Um, but since I've moved back to Sydney, I'm now an ambassador or a Sambassador <laughs> for uh, Sydney Dogs and Cats Home, uh, who are another fantastic organization. Yeah. Uh, I host a lot of events for them. I've got an event coming up for them in about a month or so. A big, they're doing a big fundraiser at the moment because they've had to move out of their current facilities, so they're moving closer to the city, which is great, yeah. But and they've got the land, but they need to raise the funds to build the, the facilities. So. Mm -hmm. So they're on a big uh, fundraising drive at the moment. So, yeah, if people yeah. are interested in supporting them, it's um, just Google Sydney Dogs and Cats Home. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've got, you know, two rescue cats of my own. I'll see if I can grab yeah, one. Yeah, let's of, grab one. Yeah, just a second. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, this one is Catra. <laughs> so Catra doesn't love being held, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> Catra's like, put me down. <laughs> yeah, so Catra is... Um, it's a, it's, how long have you had Catra for? I haven't seen much of Catra. Um, well, Catra's a bit of a social recluse. You right. probably would have seen a lot more of um, yes. Coco, who's yep. the Kim Kardashian of yes. cats. Yes, yep. Um, <laughs> Catra is, is basically blind. She's got maybe 10% vision. Oh. And um, Coco only has two teeth. Oh. <laughs> I've got to get Coco. Sorry, okay, just give me up, a yeah. moment. It's, it'll be worth it. You can tell everyone about Coco while I'm Okay, away. yeah. So Coco has appeared quite heavily on Sam Mack's uh, page. Um, he's kind of like a full-on floppy cat and full of personality. So, yeah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say about her? I was saying that you've appeared quite heavily on the, on the news feed and a uh, big floppy cat that just loves the camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is Coco. Um, she's a Burr Miller. Um, as you can maybe see, she's only got two teeth, <laughs> little baby. But um, she is uh, like a lap dog. She loves she loves human interaction. Yeah. Um, she's a bit of a floozy, so she'll become best friends with any new person in the house. Um, Here's another lap dog. Oh wow! <laughs> little, my little pee pee. She's just so I've just woken cute. her up, so she's just like, what, what, what's happening? Uh, I'm too tired. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you know those those videos. You might have seen those videos on YouTube of like soldiers who come back from war and yeah. their dog their dog greets them and the dog gets really excited. Coco's yeah. like that every day when I come home. Oh, really? She's, wow. Yeah, she, she follows you around the house. I mean, mainly because she wants to be fed. But um, yeah, <laughs> don't take you away. <laughs> oh, fantastic! All right. Well, look. Um, thank you so much for everything for spending your time with us and for being such a um, compassionate leader in the field that you're in and doing all the great work that you're doing. Um, it's just, yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's Thank a really you. great um, contribution to the world. And so, yeah, anything we can do to support what you're doing, um, I'll, I'll pop all the links below for people to see. But thank you so okay. much for being um, – actually, one last question that I do yeah. ask all my people on. Sure. Um, let me just – I think PP was giving me – my dog was giving me the signal – that it's time to finish because she stood on the pillow and the light switched off. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> she, she just jumped off the couch and must have hit, um, hit the cord and then all the lights went off. <laughs> so I was like, it's time, it's time to stop. Yes, it's time to stop. That's her telling, telling me to shut up. Um, yeah, so I usually ask people what their perception of um, being digitally conscious means to them. Yeah, yeah. Um... For me, being digitally conscious means using digital for good. Yeah. Pretty simple but important. Um, you know, like that's not to say that you can't just use it for fun or for, you know, putting a photo up of what you've had for dinner. Not that I do that personally. <laughs> it would just be takeaway every night. Um, but, but it's using it for good. You know, it's um, like the Polish man is a prime example. Like I love sharing photos, you know, and, and getting other people who are in the media involved, getting them to paint a nail. Yeah. Um, Sydney Dogs and Cats Home, I love sharing, you know, say there's a dog that's been at the, at the home for two years and can't get a home. I'd love to jump on a cause like that and help spread that message. So, yeah, yeah I, I think it's just an extension of having compassion in real life, in day-to-day -day life. You know, it's yeah. just moving that into the digital space. And, um yeah. And there's a lot of power there. You know, there's a lot and that has been achieved and a lot that will be achieved through using those tools. So use them for good, not evil, I guess. <laughs> I love it. No, you're a beautiful soul. Thank you so much <laughs> for um, taking the time to chat with us today. 
Really appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. All right.